So Psalm 38, and um, the title of the message this morning is A Sinner's Only Hope. Psalm 38, A Sinner's Only Hope. So before I get into the study this morning, uh, let me go ahead and open up in another word of prayer, and then we'll look at this uh, together this morning. Uh, well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much once again for this time, for this privilege, Lord, this honor to come here together as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, to hear from you, Lord, to worship you, to seek your face. And we pray this morning, Lord, as your word is taught, that you would just fill this place, fill me, Lord, fill us all with the power and the person of your Holy Spirit. Help us to have understanding, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord, that you continue to just have your way in this church, have your way in this place, Lord. And help us, Lord, just help us to leave different, as Pastor Angel prayed earlier. Help us to leave different from how we came in here this morning. Whatever um, distractions we have, whatever speed bumps are in the way, Lord, that we would just put those at your feet, that you would remove those, Lord, that we would just focus on you. We thank you once again for the privilege of knowing you and just for the privilege of coming here together to study your word together as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We ask all these things. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 38, and as we read this psalm this morning, as we go through this together, what we're going to notice, what we're going to realize as, is that this psalm is filled with a lot of pain and a lot of darkness, as David feels the heaviness and the guilt of his sin, both physically and mentally. And this psalm is very similar, very reminiscent to Psalm 70. Um, there in Psalm 70, we see a prayer for deliverance. And this psalm here, Psalm 38, is known as one of the penitential psalms. And a penitential psalm is, is basically a psalm where the psalmist feels the sorrow and the regret for their actions. And Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, 102, 130, and Psalm 140 are also known as penitential psalms including this one here, Psalm 38. Now, as far as the occasion in David's life that this psalm is referring to, uh, many scholars guess at the time. They, they really don't know for sure whether David is speaking of the time when he had that adulterous, um, uh, sinful act with Bathsheba, or maybe it was during another time in his life. There's really no certainty as far as this psalm. But what we do know is that this psalm deals with some heaviness that David is dealing with. And what we can conclude is that his sin, the sin in his life, had brought him to the Lord's chastening. And actually, David was very sick at this time. And one thing we have to remember is that not all affliction, not all illness or sickness comes from disobedience. So, for example, if you look in the Gospel of John, for example, there in chapter 9, if you remember there, Jesus is in the midst of his earthly ministry. He's on fire, he's preaching, he's healing. He's, he's moving in ways that are just amazing, they're beautiful. But there, if you remember, he performs his sixth miracle, okay? He heals a man that was born blind. And his disciples ask him, you know, who had sinned for this guy to be blind or to be born blind? And Jesus tells them, neither him nor his parents had sinned, but rather this came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. However, on the other end of the spectrum, physical troubles and illness can be a consequence to our sins. And in fact, if you look in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, there Jesus performs his third earthly miracle. If you remember there at the pool called Bethesda, he heals a man that had been disabled for 38 years. And if you remember, he tells the man, he says, see, you are well, do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. But what we know about David this morning is that he was well aware of his sin, and he wanted God to remember him and to deliver him, to grant him forgiveness, and to grant him healing. And, you know, David is in such bad shape because of his sin, and he just wants relief right away from all of this, this horribleness. And when you think about sin, sin is just this loathsome, horrible disease. And when you think about it, sin, when we allow it to come into our lives and let it sit there, it spreads like a wildfire and it festers. It's, it's, it's a horrible thing. And what we see with David, in addition to this illness and, and all these things that he's dealing with, he also is isolated. He's shunned from his friends. They abandon him. And his enemies try to wipe him out in the process as well. 
So what we will see today through this psalm is that when God's people suffer the consequences of their sin and they feel the chastening hand of God, they can either, number one, focus on themselves and experience sin's painfulness. They can, number two, focus on the people around them and experience sin's loneliness. Or thirdly, they can focus on the Lord and experience sin's forgiveness. And what we will see through David is that he goes through this process and ultimately he puts the focus on the Lord and sin's forgiveness. And I think the question becomes, what about us? When we go through a season where we allow sin back into our life, sin becomes this habitual thing in our life. Do we turn to ourselves and we experience pain, the painfulness from the sin? Do we look to the loneliness that comes from the sin? Or do we turn to the Lord and do we experience the forgiveness of sin. And that's something we want to think about as we go through this together this morning. So what I'm going to do first is let me go ahead and read the entire psalm. It's only 22, 22 verses, so it's not, it's not Psalm 119. So, so no worries there. We'll read this together, and then we'll look at this um, verse by verse. So Psalm 38, here David writes, Lord, do not punish me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has breast down on me. There's no soundness in my body because of your indignation. There's no health in my bones because of my sin. For my inequities have flooded over my head. They are a burden too heavy to bear, for me to bear. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am bent over and brought very low. All day long I go around in mourning, for all my insides are full of burning pain, and there's no soundness in my body. I am faint and severely crushed. I groan because of the anguish of my heart. Lord, my every desire is in front of you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart races, my strength leaves me, and even the light of my eyes has faded. My loved ones and friends stand back from my affliction, and my relatives stand at a distance. Those who intend to kill me set traps, and those who want to harm me threaten to destroy me. They plot treachery all day long. I am like a deaf person I do not hear. I am like a speechless person who does not open his mouth. I am like a man who does not hear and has no arguments in his mouth. For I put my hope in you, Lord. You will answer me, my Lord, my God, for I said, don't let them rejoice over me, those who are arrogant towards me when I stumble. For I am about to fall, and my pain is constantly with me. So I confess my inequity. I am anxious because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and powerful. Many hate me for no reason. Those who repay evil for good attack me for pursuing good. Lord, do not abandon me. My God, do not be far from me. Hurry to help me, my Lord, my salvation. Amen. So this morning, the first thing we're going to, to realize or, or witness here in this psalm, number one, is the depth of David's troubles. Okay, the depth of David's troubles. And that'll be the first 14 verses, and we'll break it down into small sections here. But the first thing that we notice here as we read the psalm in the first two verses is that David is pierced by God's displeasure. So once again, here David declares, he says, Lord, do not punish me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have sunk into me and your hand has pressed down on me. So notice here that David opens by addressing the Lord directly here. And the Hebrew word used here for the Lord is Jehovah. And what we see is that even though David sensed the Lord's wrath and the Lord's anger towards him because of his sin, he didn't turn from the Lord, but rather he looked to the Lord. And if you look here in the second part of verse 1, actually it's, it's in the, the first part and the second part of verse 1, we see that David believes that the Lord is doing two things here. Number one, that he's punishing or rebuking him. And number two, that he is disciplining or chastening him. And when you think about the Lord, you think about a loving father, that's exactly what a loving father does, right? If you look in the Proverbs chapter 3, there in verse 11, 
It says there, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. And furthermore, if you remember a few weeks ago, you know, Pastor Angel talked about this there in, in chapter 12 of Hebrews, in those first 11 verses, and the benefits of discipline and chastening and correcting. Those are things that a heavenly father, a loving father does. And this is exactly what we see happening um, with David this morning in this psalm. But if you look in the second verse, notice he says, For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has pressed down on me. So what we see here is David is painting this picture of how we deeply felt the displeasure um, of the Lord. And if you notice here, he talks about the Lord's arrows sinking into him. And this is likely referring to the acute pains that he was feeling because of his sin, right? Every one of these arrows was an indication um, of, those, of those pains that he was feeling in his body. And then he says that the Lord's hand, right, was pressing down on him, right? Pressing down on me is what he says here. And um, when you think about what we're reading here, and as we go through this this morning, we're going to see that as we go along this psalm, the depths of David's sin and how those depths, the depth of that sin is actually causing all of this pain to him. And because of this, he's expressing this agony and all this distress, all because of his sin. But what's interesting here is if you think about our Lord Jesus Christ, and um, you think about the agony and the pain that he faced, not because of his sin, but because of all of our sin, you can kind of get a picture of what David's describing here when he went to the cross, right? When Jesus went to the cross. And I love how Horn puts this. He says, the holy Jesus at the time of his passion received these arrows and sustained this weight for the sins of the whole world. And certainly when we can understand the agony, right? Agony that Jesus felt at the cross Agony that he felt even the day before, if you remember there in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying, crying out to his father, how he was in such distress and agony that he even started to sweat blood. We can give a better understanding of the great love that he has for us. And certainly understanding this agony and pain, um, it kind of wakes us up a little bit. And in a sense, David is getting a taste of that pain and that agony because of his sin. And in no way is it equal to what Jesus felt, but just a taste of it. And that's what sin does to us when we find ourselves in that unhealthy cycle of habitual sin. We feel the weight of it. We feel the distress of it. We feel the, the disgust of it, just like Jesus did at the cross for all of us. And it wasn't his sin. Remember, it was our sin that did this to him. Now, as we continue here in verse 3, um, verse 3, 4, and 5, what we're going to see here is that David is so overwhelmed with this inequity. He says, there's no soundness in my body because of your indignation. There's no health in my bones because of my sin, for your inequities have flooded over my head. They are a burden too heavy for me to bear. My wounds are foul and festering because of my um, foolishness. Now, David did not only sense the Lord's displeasure spiritually, but he also felt it physically right? He was physically sick. Whether it was illness or injury, it was all because of the sin in his life. And we know in this room that, you know, even before I came to Jesus Christ and I was in a life that was just full of sin, you know, you know that sin affects you, affects you physically, right? And, and people can see that on the outside, what, what sin does to you. But it also affects us mentally, and that's something that not everyone necessarily sees. Because whenever you're in this vicious cycle of habitual sin, sin that just is occurring in this vicious cycle, um, it causes a lot of anxiety. It causes a lot of stress. And, you know, you think about it, you're trying to hide yourself. You're trying to, to prevent other people from knowing what you're doing, what you're going through. And it leads to lies and then lies to cover that lie. It's just this horrible cycle of agony that, that we, um, we instill on ourselves. So people see what it does physically to us, but they may not necessarily, necessarily see what it does to us mentally. But what we will see here with David is that there is no part of his anatomy that is spared because of his sin. And um, this is a very difficult and painful time for him. And once again, we can all relate to him. Um, 
as we too have gone through seasons like this. But even now in Christ Jesus, we're not sinless, right? We're still sinners. We're still in the flesh. But we should have a desire to sin less because of our relationship with Jesus Christ and the fact that the Holy Spirit is helping us and guiding us in the process. Um, but just as David, when we go through these seasons of deep spiritual depression, it takes a big toll on us physically and mentally. And notice that David recognizes that some of this misery is at the hand of God. But he also knew that he wasn't a victim here, right? He was well aware of the sin in his life that was causing all of this agony and all of this pain, this crisis that he found himself in. And, you know, often when we find ourselves in sin and in the middle of the consequences of our sin, um, because there's always going to be consequences to our actions, we often like to blame God for that. We blame Him and we don't own the fact that it's because of our sin that we've gotten ourselves into that circumstance or that predicament. And it isn't until we finally recognize that we did this to ourselves, kind of like David here, that we can begin on that road to um, repentance and restoration. And when we don't listen to the words of our Lord's heart, we will certainly feel the weight of his hand on us, just as David is um, as we read this psalm this morning. And, you know, I once heard, I heard it said that um, sin is the wound of the soul. And when your soul is wounded, that's, that's very heavy. So that's what sin does to us. Sin is this stinking disease that spreads and it festers and it weighs us down and it affects us physically and mentally. So as we continue here, David continues describing um, his turmoil. In verse 6, he says, I am bent over and brought very low. All day long I go around in mourning, for my insides are full of burning pain and there's no soundness in my body. I am faint and severely crushed. I groan because of my anguish, because of the anguish of my heart. So it says here that David is bent over very low, he says here. And as you can imagine, the pain that he was experiencing in his body, it was so debilitating, it was causing him um, to, to be distorted from his original uprightness. And also, when you think about his soul, it was probably filled with so much guilt. It was also distorted because of this situation that he found himself in, um, whatever part of this life he's, he's referring to here. And unfortunately for David, once again, sin has affected him in every way um, possible. And in fact, if you look in verse 5, which was in the section before this, he kind of describes the wounds that he, he had, right? That they were festering. And once again, when we allow sin to take root in our lives, we let it sit there. It starts to spread like a forest fire, and it begins to fester. It begins to rot us from the inside out. And here, David is, is so depressed. He's listing all these bodily afflictions, right? He talks about his insides, that they're full of burning pain. And, um, you know, some scholars suggest this could be pain from his internal organs. It could be his kidneys. It could be fever. Um, we don't know specifically what that is. We just know that he had these burning pains inside. He says, there's no soundness in my body. Um, he was faint. There was anguish in his heart. So absolutely no part of his anatomy was spared because of his sin and because of the chastening hand of God here. But just like David, all of us in this room, myself included, we're free to disobey God, um, but we're not free to change the consequences because of our disobedience, right? We have to own those things. And, you know, our human nature is to, to readily and willingly wallow in sin, isn't it? And even though the pleasure of sin is so short-lived, um, we want to wallow in it. We want to be in sin because that's our nature. That's our human nature. That's how we were born, right? That's how we were conceived. Psalm 51 speaks of this. Um, however, when it comes to the, to the consequences of our sin, we always want to take the correspondence course, don't we? We don't want to own the consequences for our sin. And, and David here, obviously, is going through that. And we've all gone through that, haven't we? As we have gone through this journey, um, running this race together, we've gone through these seasons where we've gone through the consequences of our sin. And we have to remember that sin, when we sin, when I sin, it doesn't just impact my life, but it impacts everybody else around me. Every person that is involved in my life experiences the consequences 
that I have been experiencing as well. And you take David, for example. If you remember in, um, in the uh, second book of Samuel there, I think it's in the 11th chapter, um, in Psalm 51, if you remember there, David had committed sin. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And if you remember there, um, and in fact, some scholars suggest this psalm could be referring to that specific event. We don't know. But what we know is that because of his sin, a lot of people were impacted. For example, Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, was murdered so he could cover up his sin. Um, the child that was to be birthed due to this adulterous act also died. So everyone suffered the consequences of this sin that David um, engaged in. A sin that was so short-lived, but had some repercussions that were so long-lived. And that's something that we have to be aware of. As brothers and sisters in Christ, as believers, we have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our minds. Um, because sin, it comes from three things. Okay, Number one, sin comes from the world. James 4.4 4 tells us, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. And when you think about the world right now around us and the divisiveness and whether you're on the left, you're on the right, you're on the top, you're on the bottom, whatever. You know, you think about social media, you think about mainstream culture, everything that is happening. It can suck us in and distract us from God. And we can wallow in that. And then that becomes sin as we, we, dis we, we um, distance ourselves from the Lord. So we have to be very careful with that. Secondly, sin comes from the devil himself. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 tells us, Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. And then, of course, if you remember in the Gospels, for example, in gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4 there, remember there, the enemy, he tempted Jesus three times, right? He tempted him with the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and um, the, uh, the lust of the eyes. However, the Lord there, he never gave in like we do. So the enemy comes, we know, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Thirdly, sin comes from our own desires, right? James chapter 1, verse 14 tells us, um, But each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. And we know from the word of God that the wages of sin, it is death. So we have to be careful. These are the things, these are the tactics that we have to be aware of. And that's why we have to keep our eyes on the Lord. And I know that this is something that's easier said than done. But as believers, we have access to everything that we need, all the tools and instruments to keep our eyes on the Lord. We just have to choose to do that daily. Every single day, we are going to fall short of God's glory. Um, Paul tells us this in the book of Romans. We're not going to be sinless, but we should desire to sinless, right? Our, our lives should be different. There should be a change in our lives when we're born again, when we're in Christ Jesus. And every day, we have to choose to walk um, in that victory, a victory that we have. We just have to walk in it. Now, as we move on here in, in verse 9, uh, verse 9 and verse 10, what we see here is that David hides nothing in his misery uh, from the Lord. And even from us, as we read the psalm this morning, he says, Lord, my every desire is in front of you. Uh, my sign is not hidden from you. My heart races. My strength leaves me. And even the light of my eyes has faded. So David here, he addresses the Lord directly once again. And here he's actually using a different Hebrew word for Lord. Um, it's Adane, which is master. And here we see David's transparency. His misery, once again, wasn't hidden from God, not even hidden from us as we read through this psalm this morning. But what's interesting here is that when we find ourselves in those seasons where we are in this habitual sinful cycle, we often want to hide from God, right? We think we can hide from God when we're in sin. And um, in fact, as, as um, we've been announcing on Wednesdays, in the men's study, we've been going to the book of Genesis. And if you remember in the book of Genesis, it's in the beginning of, of the book there in chapter 3, when we see the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, remember, after they ate from the tree of knowledge of good, uh, good and evil, remember that they hid from God. They were ashamed because of their nakedness. 
But in this case, David chooses to be transparent and upfront with the Lord as he's sharing these agonies and these pains and these difficulties directly with the Lord. And he's hiding nothing from him. And this is exactly how we need to be, coming boldly to the throne of grace, bringing all of our anxieties, all of our worries, everything to the Lord, asking for mercy, asking for his grace, taking our minds off of the suffering and putting it back on the Lord. And once again, that's something that's easier said than done, but it's something that we have to do. You see, the Lord already knows what's at the depth of our hearts. He just needs to hear it from us, doesn't he? Um, if you look in the, in the epistle of James, there in the fourth chapter, verse two, it says, you desire and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasure. So we have to ask the Lord truly wholeheartedly with the right motives, but he'll hear us and he'll grant us the things that he desires for us. And the way we do that is through prayer, crying out to the Lord. And I know of that prayer, we know that prayer is a very powerful tool and it, it's an instrument that we as believers as a church don't utilize enough. And that's something that we need to do. We need to pray, constantly communicating with the Lord and, and just bringing everything to him. Even the things in our hearts that we can't even put into words, the Lord knows what those things are, those groans, those things that you know, we can't even express. He hears them, he knows them. We just have to turn to him and cry out to him. Throughout the day, when you're at work, when you're at school, wherever you find yourself, you know, tell the Lord to help you, to guide you, to lead you. Give him the things that are worrying you, that are giving you anxiety, that are making you anxious. Those are the things you can't fix, but the Lord can fix. Um, because he's the Lord, right? He's in control. He has you um, in his hands. Now, as we continue on to the next few verses, uh, what we're going to see is that there's even more difficulty that David is facing. It's not just these physical issues that he's uh, dealing with. But if you look in verse 11, um, all the way through verse 14, what we are going to see is that David is actually going to be forsaken by his friends and hunted by his enemies, okay? So here David shifts the focus off of himself and, and, and puts it more on the people around him. And we can kind of see the impact of sin, not just on David, but also on the people around him. So that, that uh, non-local impact of the consequences that sin can have. And here we're going to see that David feels lonely. He feels abandoned. Um, because remember, sin doesn't just distance us from God. It also distances us from the people that love us the most, the people that want us well and out of sin. And unfortunately, that's what sin does to us. And notice he says in verse 11, he says, My loved ones and friends stand back from my affliction, and my relatives stand at a distance. And, you know, reading that, that is, that is probably an extremely difficult thing. If you could imagine having the people in your life that have been the most encouraging, the most supportive, the ones that comfort you, no longer a part of your life anymore. You're all alone. You're abandoned. That could be very heavy. You know, because often in times like these that David is facing, the little relief you can get can actually be from those people that can give you the encouragement and the comforting and the peace um, that you need through the Lord uh, to get through that difficult situation. He had no one to fall back on. He had the Lord, though, but he had nobody to fall back on as far as relatives and friends at that time. And as you could imagine, that's a very dark and difficult place to be, a place where the enemy can corner you and keep you and, and make things a little bit more difficult for you. He didn't have anyone, but he, only, he did have the Lord, though. He did have the Lord still. The Lord had not abandoned him. And I think one thing we can learn from this on the other side of the table, as brothers and sisters in Christ, our sole desire and our goal as believers, um, when people, brothers and sisters, are in a cycle of sin, our heart should be for restoration, not condemnation, and not to shun them and push them away from the church. That is the worst thing we can do. But we have to be careful too because we're still in the flesh. The sins that they are dealing with might be something that we might start to deal with as well because we're still in the flesh. We're not unsusceptible to sin just because we're in Christ, right? Until we're, we're with him in, in his presence, then that's a different story. But as long as we're on this earth, we can still have those, um, we can still deal with those sins, still be tempted by those sins. So we have to be careful when we restore a brother or a sister in Christ. And in fact, Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, or the letter to the Galatians, the letter to the Galatians in chapter 6, there in verses 1 through 3, he says, Brothers and sisters, 
If someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And then furthermore, if you look in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, Paul there declares, If anyone has caused pain, he has caused pain not so much to me, but to some degree, not to exaggerate, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is sufficient for that person. As a result, you should instead forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overwhelmed by excessive grief. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. I wrote for this purpose, to test your character, to see if you are obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I do too. For what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it is for your benefit in the presence of Christ, so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So we don't want to allow, allow the enemy to use an isolated brother or sister in Christ who's in sin that we refuse to restore because we think we're so self-righteous or maybe we're better or beyond helping them. We don't want to let the enemy use that for his advantage and, and put them in a deeper hole. And the thing is, we have to keep fighting for them through prayer. And I can assure you in this life, there are going to be people that are going to deceive you. They're going to hurt you. They're going to step all over you. They're going to take advantage of you. They're going to sin against you. But we have to be willing to forgive them just as the Lord has forgiven us for all of our sins. And we have to be careful once again, because there's also an issue where um, if someone refuses to change, if someone refuses to repent of their sin, we can't let them take us hostage in the process, right? Sometimes it's best just to let them be, but continue praying for them, fighting for them through intercession and, and keeping them in your minds and in your hearts. The Proverbs tell, tell us in Proverbs 12, verse 15, it says, A fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. So whenever we find ourselves in a situation like David, it's always wise to reach out to a brother or a sister in Christ, to your church, whoever it is, because the, the whole purpose of this is for restoration. We want to restore one another. Because none of us in this room, it doesn't matter who's up here, whether it's me or Pastor Angel, anyone in this room is unsusceptible to sin, right? We are all still in the flesh and we can all fall. And that's why we have to keep praying for one another and be there for one another. That way we don't end up like David did in, in, his, um, in his deep depression that became so agonizing. Now it's affecting him physically and mentally. If you look in verse 12, um, David continues and he says, Those who intend to kill me set traps. And those who want to harm me threaten to destroy me. They plot treachery all day long. So, you know, to add insult to injury... In addition to being abandoned by those that he loved the most, that were close to him, now he was facing the determination of, of his enemies, right? And they were constantly plotting um, to destroy him, is what he says here. And the truth of the matter is, we cannot have true peace unless we are reconciled with God. And in fact, if you look in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, it says, When a person's ways please the Lord, he even makes his enemies to be at peace with him. And what we have witnessed so far here is that, you know, David in the midst of his sin, he needs to be reconciled with God. He needs to, he needs to confess this sin to him. And we'll see a little bit later that he actually does this as he's crying out to the Lord. And if not, he's not going to have that true peace that he needs. And, and we know what that's like, right? We know that peace that surpasses all understanding. When we are in the middle of a, a sinful cycle, until we give that up to the Lord, um, we're not going to have peace. We're going to be in that agonizing, um, that state, that kind of David is in here, both physically and mentally. And that's why we have to give it all to the Lord. Ask him to help us, ask him to forgive us, and, and get us onto that road of, of um, repentance and recovery. If you look in verse 13, um, he continues here and he says, I'm like a deaf person. He says, I do not hear. I'm like a speechless person who does not open his mouth. I'm like a man who does not hear 
and has no arguments in his mouth. So what we see here is that David is, he's so depressed, he's so afflicted. Um, he was powerless to even respond to his attackers, these enemies. And, and that's what sin does to us, right? It's completely debilitating. It's a debilitating thing. It's a terrible thing. And, and just like David, when we get to that point where we're unable to defend ourselves, um, we're at the bottom of the barrel, only then do we finally realize that all we need is God. And God's always there. Psalm 50 verse 15 tells us, Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will honor me. So David, once again, he had no arguments um, to these malicious attacks that these individuals were, were bringing towards him, his enemies. And it's interesting because out of submission to God, what we see here is that he's speaking to the Lord, right? But he's remaining silent when it comes to these enemies or these individuals that were coming against him. And I love how uh, Spurgeon puts it. He says, David was bravely silent, and Heron was eminently typical of our Lord Jesus, whose marvelous silence before Pilate was far more eloquent than words. So we see David going through this difficult process, losing family and friends, being in agony and pain, physically and mentally, and now being hunted down by his enemies. But yet he was still calling on the name of the Lord. So, so far, what we've seen in this psalm has been heavy. Maybe it's been uncomfortable. I know when I was reading this, it was very uncomfortable to read because you remember those times in your life when you've gone through seasons like that, where you feel so alone and so far away from the Lord. Um, but now what we're going to see in the second half of this psalm is a glimmer of hope um, in the Lord. So that'll be verses 15 um, to the end here. And if we look in the first two verses, verse 15 and 16, what we see here is a hope in God who listens. A hope in a God who listens. And of course, the Lord is always listening, right? He wants to hear from us. And here David writes, he said, For I put my hope in you, Lord. You will answer me, my Lord, my God. For I said, don't let them rejoice over me, those who are arrogant toward me when I stumble. And this is actually very beautiful because what we see here is that once again, David chooses to allow these afflictions and these difficulties in his life to push him towards God and not away from God, right? The God of all hope. And, you know, I heard somebody once say, they said this, they said, your, prof your most profound and intimate experiences of, of worship will likely be in your darkest days, when your heart is broken, when you feel abandoned, when you're out of options, when the pain is great, and you turn to God alone. It's when you're in that, in that place, when you recognize that all you have is God and all you need is God. You know, as difficult as that position can be, that's actually the most beautiful place to be because you realize that he's all you need and he's all you want. And that's the best place to be. So David here chooses to turn to God alone. And just like David, when we cling to the Lord, even in those moments when all hope is lost, you know, there's always hope. And in fact, Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, there he writes, If we are faithless, he, speaking of the Lord, remains faithful, for he cannot deny um, himself. So even when we've lost all faith, we've lost all hope, the Lord hasn't. And we can cling to him, we can reach out to him, and he's there for us. And whenever we call upon the name of the Lord, he will always answer. He will always answer us. He, he, we, it never goes to voicemail. He's always there. And um, if you look in verse 15, actually, this is very interesting. If you look in verse 15, as he's crying out to the Lord, um, you see how he says, For I put my hope in you, Lord, you will answer me, my Lord, my God. So he has the word Lord twice there, and then he has the word God there. What's interesting in that verse is he actually uses three different Hebrew words um, to name the Lord there. So, for example, the first Lord is translated as Yahweh. And there it's referring to the covenant God of Israel. So there, in a sense, he's kind of remembering the promises that the Lord had made to his children or to his people. The second instance of Lord is translated Adane, which refers to master. So he's referring to him as his master, as his leader, right? This hope, this master, this individual, the Lord. And then the word God there in that last part of verse 15 is translated um, Elohim, which is the, pl the plural um, for the word um, God. So that's very interesting there. 
And this individual, right, the Lord, God, right, um, that he's calling upon is the same person that we can call upon in our moments of difficulties and, and, um, and trials and, and um, sinfulness. Whatever it is we're going through, we can call upon his name, even in seasons of harvest and, and greatness taking place in our lives. Um, but what we see here is that David calls out to the, God, to the Lord, not only because of his suffering, but he didn't want his adversaries to rejoice over him as well, right? And when they slandered David's name, his enemies, as they were going against him, they were also slandering the name of the Lord. And when you think about it, all of us in this room, whenever somebody slanders our name for the Lord's sake, they're actually slandering the name of the Lord and not necessarily you. So we can't take that personal because it's all in the Lord's hands. As we continue into verse 17, what we're going to see here is that David is ready to fall before his strong enemies. It says there, For I am about to fall, and my pain is constantly with me, he says. So I confess my inequity. I am anxious because of my sin, but my enemies are vigorous and powerful. Many hate me for no reason. Those who repay evil for good attack me, for pursuing good. So what we see here in verse 17 is that, you know, even in the midst of honoring the Lord, David also felt that he was to the point where he was about to die. He was ready to fall, it says here. And in verse um, 18, this is actually really beautiful. He begins to confess his inequity, his sins to the Lord in true repentance and faith, right? He says, so I confess my inequity. He tells him I'm anxious because of my sin. Right? He's crying out to the Lord. And we know as believers that this is something that we can do too. And we know that anyone who comes before God asking for forgiveness will never be denied. If you look in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, there it says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. 1 John 1, 9 tells us, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. And, you know, the Lord is always waiting for us to come to him and he, because he's so good. We serve a Lord that is so good and we're so blessed. And of course, we know that the Lord looks at our heart in the process, right, as we come to the Lord. It can't just be our lip service. It has to be the state of our heart. And this kind of reminds me of what we read in Psalm 51. There, once again, David, in a very difficult situation, in verse 16, um, into verse 17, he says, or he writes, You do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. He says, A sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. So the Lord looks at our heart. And when it comes to repentance, turning from our sin, this is something where we have to understand what that actually means, right? It's not just being sorry because you got caught or because, um, you know, somebody saw you doing what you, were, what you weren't supposed to be doing, but truly being sorry for what you did, right? Right? Hating sin like God hates sin, despising sin like the Lord despises sin. Because it's not until we despise sin that we're going to turn from it. Because if you don't despise it, you're going to come back to it and keep coming back to it. And we should despise sin because we know that sin grieves our Father. It grieves our Heavenly Father. We talked a little bit about this um, when we talked about Jesus at the beginning. Remember when he went to the cross for us, how the sin of the world grieved him and it was agonizing for him. It was a, it was a terrible thing. Um, we think about God the Father, for example. If you, if you go to the beginning of the Bible, there in the book of Genesis, for example, if you remember in the days of Noah, the wickedness and the sin that was occurring on the land, on the planet, he even said there in the sixth verse of the sixth chapter of Genesis that he grieved and that he regretted that he had created man or made man on earth. He was so grieved with sin. Additionally, the Holy Spirit can be grieved as well because of our sin. And when you think about the presence of God on the planet right now, it's the power in the person of the Holy Spirit, living in the church, living in you, living in me. Because God the Father and God the Son, Jesus, they're in heaven right now, right? Jesus is seated at his right hand. The book of Romans tells us in the eighth, in the eighth chapter, 
And in, in terms of the Holy Spirit, if you look in Ephesians chapter 4, there in the 29th verse, it says there that we can quench the Holy Spirit, right? I'm sorry, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. If you look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, there it says that we can grieve, we can quench the Holy Spirit. Quench is the one from 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry. And then grieve is the one from, from Ephesians. So, in other words, because the Holy Spirit lives in you, lives in me, everything that we go through, everything that we experience, the Holy Spirit's going through that with us. And he can feel that quenching and that grieving as we do when sin comes back into our lives, right? So that's something we have to remember, that it impacts us, it impacts everybody around us, and it grieves our Heavenly Father. And that's why we need to hate sin as he hates sin. And what we see here is that David is kind of at this point where he's trying to get rid of this, right? Like, I, I want to, to have these sins, take them away from me. He's crying out to the Lord. And he also asks the Lord to help him because his enemies were more powerful, he says here, in strength, and they were going against him for no reason. So here we are. We see David in this, this difficult, um, kind of at the, the bottom of the barrel now, but finally crying out to the Lord and um, declaring or asking for mercy here. And then what we notice here in verse 21 and 22, in this urgent plea to the Lord, he says, Lord, do not abandon me. My God, do not be far from me. He says, hurry to help me, my Lord and my salvation. So notice here he asks for three specific things, right? He has these three requests as he um, closes this urgent plea here. He says, do not abandon me. And we know that the Lord will never, ever leave us, right? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 tells us, there in the second part of the verse, he says, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And then secondly, he asks um, the Lord to not be far from him. And we know that the Lord's not far from us, right? We're the ones that distance ourselves from God. God's always there. James chapter 4 verse 8 tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the truth of the matter is all of us in this room, we are as close to God as we choose to be, right? And we have the word of God. We have prayer. We have our brothers and sisters in Christ we can fellowship with. We have the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. We have everything we need to draw closer to God, to tap into the Lord, right? But often we want to tap out. We need to tap into the Lord. We have all the tools and instruments that we need to do that. And then thirdly, he asked the Lord to hurry to help him. And what we need to understand is that absolutely nothing um, can separate us from the Lord's love, from the Lord's help, from the Lord's mercy, and, and from His grace. If you look in the book of Romans, chapter 8, there beginning in verse 13, Paul writes and he reminds us, he says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare His own Son, but gave Him up for, all, for us all. How will He not also how will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am, not, I am persuaded, rather, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And this is what we call the believer's triumph. And this is what we have. This is what we can confide in. So the Lord will never leave us. He will never abandon us. He will never be far from us. And he will always help us. That's something that we can confide in. And then the last thing we see here in verse 22 is that David refers to the Lord as his um, salvation. So as, we, as we've gone through this, this uh, psalm, I know it was very heavy at the beginning, but even in the latter part, it was still kind of heavy. But there was always this glimmer of hope. So in closing this morning, what we saw with David 
is that as he cried out to the Lord, he wanted the Lord to remember him, grant him forgiveness, and to heal him. And we know that David was in such bad shape because of his sin, both physically and mentally. And when you think about sin, once again, it's this horrible, stinking disease that spreads like a wildfire in our lives, and it sits there and it festers, and it impacts everybody around us, doesn't it? And in the case of David, it caused his friends to shun him, to, to kind of isolate him, get away from him. And it also caused his enemies to try to wipe him out. And what we saw through this psalm is that when we suffer the consequences of our sin and we feel the chastening hand of God, we can either, number one, focus on ourselves and experience the painfulness that sin brings. We can focus on the people around us and, and focus on the, the uh, loneliness that sin brings. Or we can focus on the Lord and experience sin's um, forgiveness. And this is exactly what we saw David do here. He decided to put the focus on the Lord so he could experience the Lord's forgiveness. So even in all of his pain and his distress, um, David still refers to the Lord here as his, um, as his salvation here in verse 22. And I truly believe, you know, David was confident that the Lord had forgiven him. And this is the same confidence that we too must have as believers, as children of the Most High. Because nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God, His mercies, and His grace. Now, maybe you're watching via the live stream, or maybe you're here in person. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you haven't declared Him as your Lord and Savior. We, we want to give you that opportunity in just a little bit here. Because if you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, there in verse 9, there it's declared, The Lord does not de delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And then furthermore, if you look in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says there, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you find yourself in life right now. It doesn't even matter what you think God thinks about you. He's waiting for you with open arms. You know, Pastor Chuck once said, God often goes to the gutter to find the recipient for his grace. He lifts him out, he washes him, and transforms him, making him into a child of God fit for his kingdom. That is God's grace. And that is a saving grace for our salvation. And as we learn this morning through this psalm, um, the Lord is David's salvation. The Lord is your salvation. He's my salvation. He's everybody's salvation who calls and who will ever call upon his name. We just need to look to him. Micah chapter 7 verse 7 declares, But I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Amen. So this morning, if you're maybe watching via the live stream, or maybe you're here in person, and um, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. And uh, maybe you are in a vicious cycle of sin right now. Maybe you're still trying to see what the world has to offer and that void in your life is still not being filled with whatever it is you're trying to fill that void with. And um, you're tired. You're tired of running. You're, you're physically ill. You're mentally um, you know, distraught. There's a lot of agony and pain in your life because of sin in your life, because of what you're looking to fill in the voids in your life. We want to offer you hope. We want to offer you a future and a loving father that will never leave you, abandon you, and will always be there to help you. So if that's you this morning, if you would just close your eyes, bow your head, and say this prayer with me. But make sure that you're saying it with all your heart as we declare, as you declare the Lord, your, your Savior this morning. So just repeat this after me. Well, Heavenly Father, this morning, I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus was buried, and I believe that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I am a sinner, and please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, and use me for your glory. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ, and you know, I can assure you that there's a celebration going on in heaven on your behalf. And um, if you need 
maybe help with your next steps, more information, you need a Bible, you need someone to pray with you, you, you need anything, please reach out to the church. Um, you can call us, you can email us, you can leave a comment there. You can come visit us. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at the corner of um, Hondo Pass and Gateway South here in Northeast El Paso. And um, we just want to thank you so much for taking the time this morning to come here to worship the Lord, to hear from Him um, through His Word. And um, we're praying for you. We pray you have a blessed week. We love you. And um, we'll see you again soon.